Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. Thank you for joining us. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemist are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Today my guest is Dr Norman Marcus, who's a clinical and muscle pain research um, director of, I should say. So he is a pain specialist. He has a fantastic background. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Marcus. Thank you for inviting me. So could you give us your background, please? Well, after attending medical school, I um, did a uh, internship in, in the old days, it was called like a rotating internship, where I went through the various aspects of uh, what a doctor might do, uh, and then decided to go on to do a residency in psychiatry. And when I was uh, doing that, I uh, became very interested in mind-body interaction, and following my residency, I uh, did a fellowship in psychosomatic medicine. And while I was doing my fellowship, I was asked by the Department of Neurology at the headache unit uh, where I was, which was at Montefiore Hospital, and they had the first headache unit in the world. And I was asked to join them um, and to start treating patients with headaches in the Department of Neurology. Um, and at that time, I was interested in biofeedback uh, and because of the whole issue of mind-body interaction. So I started to evaluate patients with headache and treat them with medication as well as the biofeedback. And at that time, I was elected uh, president of the New York State Biofeedback Society. And then following a few years uh, doing that, I was asked by the Department of Anesthesiology to start the first pain center in New York City. Uh, in the Department of Anesthesiology, and I did that with a colleague, an anesthesiologist, Edith Kepish, and we together uh, started and then ran together uh, the pain center at Montefiore Hospital, which I did for approximately seven years, and we had a multidisciplinary program where we're teaching patients how to manage their pain using nerve blocks at times and medication and psychological interventions and relaxation training. And then from there, I was asked by the Department of Medicine at Lenox Hill Hospital to start an inpatient pain treatment program, which I did um, and ran that for um, about uh, 20 years, actually. And um, then while I was there, uh, I... Um, was asked by the Princess Margaret Hospital uh, in Windsor um, to start a pain center. And I started to travel to the UK uh, one week a month for three years. Uh, and I, I, I have an appointment in the NHS, and I ran the pain center there. And while we were there, we got some uh, uh, significant uh uh, publicity, and we were on the BBC, uh, BBC Two, and we were on uh, television and uh, numerous radio programs, and um, we were able to help patients uh, who had persistent pain. And by that time, I was starting to focus on soft tissue. And um, what had happened was that I was introduced to Hans Krauss, who was President Kennedy's uh, physician for his back. 
and uh, Hans Krauss um, had a, um, a, a technique and a, a conceptual model on assessing soft tissue pain, muscle pain. Um, and the president at that time was being treated by another physician, uh, Janet Travell, and she was injecting Kennedy actually five or six times a day into wow. his muscles. And uh, when Hans Krauss came in, um, he stopped the injections completely and said that the problem wasn't all the muscles that needed to be injected, but rather muscles that were very deconditioned, as well as maybe some muscles that needed injections. But to think of all muscles that are tender as a target for an injection, like dry needling or something like that, didn't make any sense. And he had a conceptual model where there were four reasons for muscle pain. Um, tension being the number one, uh, then uh, deficiency, uh, or otherwise known as weakness and or stiffness of key postural muscles. And then the third was spasm, which is involuntary contraction of the muscle, but you, know, you can't straighten up and it's very painful. And the fourth was altered muscle tissue called trigger points. Um, in, in most uh, 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 jargon, when, when we're talking about these tender spots, but actually uh, Dr. Krause's concept was more than trigger points because he recognized that the area of the muscle that was <clears throat> causing pain wasn't really in the muscle belly, in the tissue, but rather the ends of the muscle where the muscle attaches to the tendon and the tendon attaches to the bone is the most tender spot um, connected to that muscle and that one needs to identify, therefore, the specific muscle that finding a spot on your body isn't sufficient because the pain isn't generated from that spot. It's rather generated from the ends of the muscle. So you must know which muscle you're in. So um, he made that distinction um, and his results when he would inject the ends of a muscle were dramatic in so far as he wouldn't have to re-inject the muscle. So the standard of care now in terms of people who are doing, uh, this, let's say, dry needling or trigger point injections is to repeat the injections over and over again quite often into the same muscle, whereas Dr. Krauss would be able to eliminate the pain by finding the muscle specifically and then going to the ends of the muscle and doing his protocol, which involved not only um, injections. And what he used was lidocaine just for comfort. He, it was the actual needle in the tissue that was doing the treatment. And following that, there's a three-day protocol uh, using uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulation and exercises that were developed at Columbia University School of Medicine in the late 50s and early 60s. And these, uh, these exercises were developed by studying 3,700 patients for four and a half years. And then he came up with an exercise program that he then administered to 300,000 people at the YMCA oh, wow. and studied 12,000 of those patients and found there was an 80% success rate in diminishing or eliminating back pain. And in patients who had uh, had surgery for the back and um, had pain afterwards, that the success rate was even higher, was 82%. So the, those exercises then became the standard exercise at the YMCA called the wise way to a healthy back, Y apostrophe S, mm. ways um, to a healthy back. And they were given for many years until someone decided to change it um, and without going into what actually happened, they essentially died the whole awareness of these exercises, but we use them as a, a routine part of um, the work that I'm doing. So when patients come in um, who have soft tissue pain, we diagnose one of these four mechanisms, you know, tension, um, which is very much what John Sarno would be speaking about, tension myositis. Uh, and now we know that there are mechanisms where if you are tense, it alters the neurons in your spinal cord um, and makes them more sensitive to input. It's called sensitization. So we also test them for weakness or stiffness using a test that Hans Krauss developed with his colleague Sonia Weber called the Krauss-Weber test. It's a very simple test. It takes about two minutes to, uh, to implement the test. It gives you a lot of information. 
And then we also would be palpating for tenderness in muscles to identify the muscle. Um, And what happened there was that um, I discovered that uh, it wasn't uh, specific enough, that many people have tender spots throughout their body that don't necessarily reflect where the pain originates. So you can have a tender point, and it may not be actually coming from there. It may be referred from another muscle. And it's almost impossible to know if you're pressing on a referral pattern or the actual pattern itself. I mean, the actual muscle itself causing it. Or, or is this just a muscle that is, is receiving information from another muscle? And all of this complication of where the pain originates was explained to me by Siegfried Mensa. So I really began to understand what was going on on a cellular level um, and on a, a bio, uh, biochemical level uh, through the work of uh, Professor Mensi. And together, ultimately, we wrote a chapter together in a Harvard textbook uh, um, that's uh, Carol Warfield is one of the uh, editors of the textbook, and it came out a couple of years ago on the pathophysiology of muscle pain. In in that period of time, um, I was elected uh, president of the American Academy of Pain Medicine and uh, served on multiple committees and became interested in how diverse the various treatments are for the pains that people are of which they're complaining, and I started the outcomes movement in pain. So to try to come up with some assessment uh, where we could measure um, if a, if a, ter- a certain treatment was superior to another treatment. And that's been an, a, a work in progress for the whole pain community. I mean, it was something that I began, uh, and we did our best to finish it, but it's still happening. And now it's a a major uh, goal and mission of uh, NIH to come up with um, parameters to measure what is successful um, outcomes in pain. And I've written a couple of chapters in neurosurgical textbooks on that. So um, I um, left um, Montefiore, went to Lenox Hill Hospital, And then I left Lenox Hill Hospital and went to NYU and became the director of um, uh, muscle pain, clinical muscle pain there in the Department of Anesthesiology and taught um, students who were fellows in the pain fellowship in the Department of Anesthesiology for um, uh, 10 years or so. Um, And uh, then uh, in the last two years, I moved to Cornell where I have an appointment in <clears throat> neurological surgery and in anesthesiology, I'm the director of clinical muscle pain research, and I'm working together with um, my colleagues in anesthesia and neurosurgery to see how we can better define how soft tissue is an important element in patients who are coming in with run-of-the-mill back pain, and then also those patients who are found to have a surgical indication for their back pain, but continue to have pain um, despite uh, an apparently successful surgical intervention. Why are they still in pain? And quite often it's because there's soft tissue that was not identified as a source of pain. Um, Along with all of this, I was beginning to to tell you about the problems in identifying a specific muscle by pressing on it um, that I've discovered that I could stimulate the muscles with a tiny amount of electricity, and I could much more accurately identify which muscle is the source of pain. Uh, And um, I'm now working on a uh, next-generation device with the Cornell School of Engineering, the Meinig School of Biomedical Engineering, um, to develop an instrument where we can um, have a software program that would show the clinician what are the various muscles uh, in the body in a region of which the patient complains of pain. For example, if you have shoulder pain, there's 16 muscles that cause pain in your shoulder. How do you know which muscle is causing the pain? You don't. 
Um, by pressing, you don't really know. But when we uh, stimulate it with a tiny amount of electricity, and that particular muscle or a couple of muscles are painful and the rest are not, mm -hmm. then we assume that those muscles are sensitized and are indeed the pain generator. And when we treat those muscles, generally we can eliminate the pain in, in a region of the body. For example, in that case, it would be the, um, the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So um, I had a patient who was coming to see me for knee pain. Um, and this was about 10 years ago or so. And she had 14 knee surgeries with the same uh, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and every time she had her knee surgery, she continued to have pain afterwards, and she was given more opioid. In this case, it was oxycodone. And when finally she was receiving something like 3,000 milligrams a day of oxycodone, which is a huge dose. So... Um, she was coming in periodically for pain medication, and uh, she was functioning. So, you know, it was, although it was a huge dose, and I wasn't entirely happy with it, um, but she was functioning. And um, so she had this extraordinary amount of medication, and she would come in periodically every month or so, and I'd renew the medication. And then she didn't show up uh, one day, and I called her home. And uh, her husband told me that she was hospitalized. And so what happened? Well, she had taken her medication, and then she had taken an anti-anxiety drug, and she fell asleep in the bathtub and almost mm. drowned and was admitted to the psychiatric unit of a hospital with an, uh, um, a supposed suicide attempt. Oh, dear. So, um, so I said, oh, my God, that was, that was terrible. And then... So she was finally discharged, but she spent about 10 days there and then uh, called me up, made an appointment, and she came in and I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm actually doing okay. I said, well, how's your knee pain? She said, I don't have any knee pain. I said, wow, really? I said, well, how, mu you know, how much medication are you taking? She says, I'm not taking any medication. Mm. I, I said, what? You're, you're, you're on 3,000 milligrams a day. She says, Yeah. So I said, well, what happened? So she said, well, there was this doctor who was there on the staff. His name was Hugo Franco. And um, he came in, and he uh, gave me uh, some medication. Actually, he gave me some naltrexone. Um, and that helped me get off the medication so that I was able to go down to zero in 10 days. So I said, oh, did you have a lot of withdrawal? She said, no, I had, I had no withdrawal. So this is impossible. I mean, it's like one of these, you know, <laughs> events saying, oh, my God, how, how could this possibly be? So I said, oh, I'm going to call up Hugo Franco, and I did. And we subsequently became friends, um, and he explained to me that he used naltrexone in uh, ultra-low dose to detox patients. Mm -hmm. So much against what, you know, was... A, in the uh, on the internet, for example, or you know, never give naltrexone in, in somebody who's on opioids. It was actually, you know, it was great because he, he explained to me that it actually made the opioid stronger if you gave it in tiny, tiny doses, so that with a more potent effect, you could then start to decrease it because you were getting the same effect with lower doses. And you can just keep on going down, um, which he did. Um, and so this was amazing for me. And then so I said, well, perhaps, you know, this could be useful with other patients. So I started to use it with patients where I wanted to facilitate a reduction in dosage or to get them off of opioids completely. And I was able to successfully use it in that fashion, but um, I still didn't quite understand how it was working until I went to a lecture by Linda Watkins, and um, she explained the whole uh, phenomena of microglia and toll-like receptor number four and how the ultra-low-dose naltrexone 
wasn't blocking the mu receptor. And I, I hope that your audience, you know, understands that. So the mu mm-hmm. receptor is where most of the action is when you're using an opioid, and and and, and pain uh, pathways. The mu is the major factor. But when you have chronic pain, microglia become very important, and the receptor that's um, that becomes stimulated on the microglia is toll-like receptor number four. And when it's stimulated, it produces cytokines, and many of these cytokines are uh, pro-inflammatory, meaning they cause inflammation, particularly interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. And that um, so these uh, cytokines end up with giving you neuroinflammation, where where you become so if you have pain it's sort of making more pain pain on top of pain um and it also gives you what's called illness behavior or sickness behavior where you feel you don't want to interact with other people you feel sluggish uh you want to just retreat be alone um sleep a lot and it's like a survival mechanism so if there was true trauma or you know some injury in your body the microglia respond by uh, giving you these cytokines or producing these cytokines that make you want to just rest a lot and not interact and not waste your energy using all your energy for repair. So I started to understand that the whole issue of central sensitization, um, which is what happens when patients have persistent pain. So one of the the issue is not all the mu receptor. We used to think it was that it was upregulation of the mu receptor, so that you you know that you needed more medication um, because of the mu receptor. But actually, that it was very much involved with activation of microglia, and that if we could suppress the microglia we could suppress pain and actually reduce tolerance, that some of the tolerance was a function of activating microglia. So I started to, um, with that understanding, look for patients who had uh, what I believed to be central sensitization, and it turned out that um, I had started to become very involved with patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And uh, that's another long story how that happened, but just suffice it to say that I, I, I've been treating a large number of patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and the most common complaint in that population is fatigue and pain. And so um, when you examine them um, using my electrical instrument, they come up with anywhere from uh, around 50 tender or sensitized muscles test positive. We're in a, uh, when I say relatively normal population who just comes in, let's say with back pain, the average number of muscles is about five. So they have 10 times the number of muscles that are sensitive to a small amount of electrical stimulation. And it would appear that uh, they have central sensitization. Uh, And um, because they are uh, sensitive to all stimuli, um, they they do have mood disorder, um, and quite often they have something else that fits in the whole picture, which is mast cell activation syndrome. So this is a, like another part of the puzzle that the mast cells, which are um, uh, cells in the body that respond to trauma and to infection, um, to any assault in the body or to a foreign body, that um, they sometimes become overactive. And the whole uh, phenomena of overactive mast cells hasn't been recognized until quite recently. And um, it turns out that patients with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, a large number of them have mast cell activation syndrome, which is not an uh, abundant number of mast cells, not too many mast cells, but rather normal number of mast cells, but the mast cells are overproducing the chemicals that they produce, and they can produce up to 200 different molecules. And you can get many different kinds of um, uh, symptoms, um, uh, but commonly would be uh, skin sensitivity, rashes, 
um, environmental allergies, GI problems with constipation and or diarrhea, commonly known as irritable bowel syndrome, um, asthmatic-like uh, problems, uh, rapid heartbeat, uh, rapid heartbeat when you're getting up quickly called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, uh, sometimes orthostatic hypotension, migraine headaches. So we see this panoply of um, symptoms and the mast cells also activate the microglia. So when you have um, hypermobile early Stanlow syndrome, you're really uh, uh, exposed to the possibilities that you not only do you have microglial activation, but you have mast cell uh, hyperactivity, and together they can uh, synergize and give you more pain because the mast cell uh, can stimulate the microglia. So in terms of my practice, you know, getting back to ultra-low-dose naltrexone, that I would say almost all the patients I see with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, I put on to ultra-low-dose naltrexone. Um, and uh, it takes a while to titrate up because we don't believe, well, it's not that we don't believe, we know that the, the dosage of 4.5 milligrams for some patients is a total overdose and they will not be able to tolerate that. And this was actually taught to me by uh, Dr. Franco, my friend. Uh, so we start with 0.1 milligram per day, and we go up by 0.1 milligram every other day in a divided dose. So it's not one dose at night, but rather four time a day dosing. So it would be 0.1, then three days, and on the third day, it will be 0.1 twice a day, on the fifth day or sixth day, it will be 0.1 three times a day. Then a couple of days after that, 0.1 four times a day. And then start again from the 0.1. So it would be 0.2, 0.1, 0.1, 0.1. Then 0.2, 0.2, 0.1.1. And going up like that until we get to maximum of somewhere between 5 and 6 milligrams a day as a maximum dose. So we have some patients who are... Their, their total daily dose is 0.15 milligrams a day, total daily dose. Mm -hmm. And we have other patients where the total dose is 6 milligrams a day. So what's the dose for ultra-low dose naltrexone? There is no dose. It's completely um, idiosyncratic, meaning each patient has their dose, whatever mm -hmm. that may be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... I didn't stop talking for a long time, that, so I'm going to stop. That is absolutely amazing, and you have wrapped it up in 30 minutes. We're going to have to have you come back and, and talk to us again because I'm sure you'd only just got started in that 30 minutes. So I'd like to say thank you very much for having joined us today. Really do appreciate it. My pleasure. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemist are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Any questions or comments you may have, please email me, linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.